Hey everybody, welcome to Always Bored, Never Boring. So, there's this new Willow series on Disney+, Plus, and it's not been getting the best ratings. Whether you're one of the viewers who has been disappointed by the quality of the show, or one of the viewers who loved the show but has been disappointed by the lack of associated merchandise, I present today, for your viewing pleasure, The Willow Game. This is a fantasy adventure game from Tor Books for 2-6 players aged 11+, plus, published in 1988. If I had to describe it in brief, I think I would have to describe it as a team-based talisman with more choices. If you like the core elements of talisman, moving around the world, flipping cards, fighting monsters and finding treasure, but you don't like roll and move mechanisms and you want to feel more like you are adventuring across a land rather than circling a drain, this game might appeal to you. If you're a Willow fan, it's probably an almost essential addition to your gaming shelf. But let's crack open the box and run through the contents. First, we have reminders that everybody thought this movie was going to be a huge hit at the time. There's an advert for the Marvel graphic novel, and a flyer for the IBM computer game from Mindscape. Then we have the rules, 12 pages total. It's pretty straightforward, but some of the rules are a little bit all over the place. For example, the instructions on how to use spells are divided among the section on encounter cards, the section on contests, and the section on spells. Nevertheless, reading through from beginning to end should put you in a good position to play your first game without too many hiccups. This is the game display. It has some instructions on what key locations on the map do, and then spaces for different cards and discard piles. You also have a space with a red pawn, and a space with a black pawn. This is quite an interesting idea. The spaces on the game board aren't really big enough to hold lots of characters, so if you ever get to a situation where there is some overcrowding, you take all the characters from the crowded location, place them on one of these two spaces on the display, and then place the corresponding coloured pawn on the map instead. Next, we have the game board itself. It's lovely quality, a little small perhaps, but the artwork is... well... it's in keeping with most of the other artwork in the game. Let's put it that way. Speaking of which, you get six character cards which also have... artwork. An interesting part of this game is that it's team-based, so up to four characters can select from the heroes, Willow, Frangine and Rule, who work as a single entity, Eric Thalbert and of course Mad Martigan, and then up to two players of villains, General Kale and Sorsha, although there are rules in the game that enable the good characters to convert Sorsha to their side. And I suppose this is as good a time as any to gently bring up the elephant in the room. Someone in this game is going to be playing for the evil team. They are going to be attempting to follow the orders of evil Queen Bavmorda regarding the infant child Alora Danon. And those orders are... unsavoury. They skirt around any specific terminology in the game, but as the evil team, your ultimate aim is going to be... removing Alora Danon from the game. It's worth mentioning, because that might not sit right with some players. But anyway, you can see that the character cards have some fixed stats under a picture, some setup instructions for the beginning of the game, and stat bars on the left and right. Some characters have a prowess stat bar on the left because they enjoy hitting things with swords, while others have a magic stat bar on the left because they enjoy hitting things with spells. The idea is you have these clips on the sides of the cards, and you move them up or down to track the current stat value. I like the fact that the magical characters can continue to improve their magic stat throughout the game. It goes up every time they fail to cast a spell, as they learn from their mistakes. But their prowess is fixed. While the reverse is true for the warriors, who increase in prowess every time they defeat an enemy. Moving on, we have stupidly oversized standees for each of these characters, and then you just get a big mess of different cards. 144 of them, to be exact. Most of these are the encounter cards that drive the game, but there are also transformation cards for when people turn into different animals, special treasure cards you can find at key locations on the map, and then two army cards, which are special items that significantly boost a character's abilities. Having an army is great, but in the case of the good army of Galadorn, it also telegraphs your presence to the evil players, making it impossible to hide from them. At the start of the game, each player is allocated a character and follows the setup instructions on their specific character card. These all tie in with the plot of the film, so Willow begins in the Nelwyn village, while Mad Martigan begins swinging in a cage at the crossroads, and isn't allowed to move until he is freed by another player, or can play a card to free himself. The final thing to do before starting a game, is the Willow player takes the Alora Danon card, and three more encounter cards from the encounter deck. 
they then distribute these four cards secretly to the four good characters. In this way, one of the good characters is protecting a Laura Dannon, but the evil players don't know who. The game is, as you can probably tell, cat and mouse. The evil players are going to move around the board trying to hunt down the good players. However, this is not some kind of hidden movement game. We'll get to that in a moment. If the evil player can find the hero with a Laura and defeat them in combat, they will seize the child. If they then take a Laura to Nokmar Castle, a Laura is removed, and the good players have one last round to defeat Bav Morda. If they fail, they lose the game. Meanwhile, the good players are trying to keep a Laura secret while they free Tyr Aslin. To do this, they need to find the scepter of Tyr Aslin, take it to Tyr Aslin, and successfully use it, and then also transport Alora to Tyr Aslin. Do all that, or alternatively just defeat Bav Morda in a magical duel, and the good team wins. So there's a lot to do, but it's all quite clear to understand. Play takes place in a series of rounds. First in each round, the good characters act, working together cooperatively rather than taking turns. Each good player draws an encounter card into their hand. They have a maximum hand limit of 5 unless a rule states otherwise. Encounter cards are in different colours and each can be played whenever a player wants to use it unless the card states a specific time. Blue cards are events or foes that you play and then discard. However, good players aren't allowed to play foes on opposing characters. Red cards are allies and equipment that you play in front of you. While they remain in play, they apply their benefits, such as adding to your prowess or granting special skills, but they also still apply to your maximum hand limit. Note that some red cards are for good players only, while others are for evil players. Black cards are spells. You play these in front of you, and they will remain face up until you decide to discard or replace them. While they are in play, when the opportunity arises, you can attempt to cast them. They do not count towards your hand limit, but you can only have a number of face-up spells equal to your current magic stat. Treasure cards and transformation cards are also printed in black, and they do not count towards your hand limit either. However, while you are transformed, your hand size is zero. After drawing encounter cards, good players must check if there are foes in their current location. Foes don't pop up randomly like in Talisman, instead they only appear if an evil player plays a foe card on a character. If there are foes, then good players must fight them. First any characters may cast spells, and then one good character is designated the champion and faces all of the foes one at a time in the order they were played. This is actually a pretty neat system because it encourages players to cooperate. For example, it really does benefit magic characters to team up with warriors. If Willow and Mad Martigan are travelling together, for example, Willow can cast a bunch of spells to turn the tide of battle, and then Mad Martigan can get to swashbuckling. He is the greatest swordsman that ever lived, after all. In other words, the game allows players to specialise, to do what their characters would realistically do, but still ensures that everyone has a role. Everyone is doing their bit to ensure success. And I guess this is as good a time as any to talk about one of the central mechanisms of the game. Contests. Most everything you will do revolves around contests. Basically, dice-offs with modifiers. A battle with a foe or opposing player requires a prowess contest. Both players roll a dice and add their character's prowess. The difference is the number of wounds the loser suffers. Casting a spell requires a magic contest. You roll the dice and add your magic stat. Another player rolls and adds the spell's resistance, and if you win the roll, the spell works. After any combats against foes, characters that didn't fight are allowed to move one or two spaces. If they want to enter a place of power, they need to find that place by moving to an adjacent location on the map and then passing a stealth contest. Once again, it's a dice-off, this time comparing the character's stealth stat against the hide value of the location. The reason the good players want to find the locations of power is because not only does each location grant a special ability, there is also a treasure housed at each of them. These treasures are distributed randomly at the start of the game and include the Scepter of Tyr Aslin, a handy set of three acorns, and even the great Finrazel herself, who starts as a possum and teaches you the transformation spell. And yes, the transformation spell does allow you to turn characters into pigs and goats, among other things. Obviously, the scepter is an essential item for the good players to win, but the other treasures are all exceptionally powerful. Plus, you know, it's fun to visit those key locations from the movie and find the characters and items that help Willow on his quest. After moving and searching, good characters have a chance to heal, and then if they are in the same space as evil characters, they can choose to fight if they want to. Play then passes to the evil side, who do almost the same thing, but with a few important differences. Villains draw two encounter cards rather than one, and can hold up to seven. This offsets the fact they are outnumbered by the heroes. 
Evil characters never fight foes, but they can throw as many as possible at the good characters to slow them down and weaken them. The other interesting difference is that evil characters are only allowed to attack good characters if they first search for them. This involves a stealth contest, the same as when looking for a location, except the contest is against the hidden character's stealth value. Only if the evil player wins the contest, the good player allows himself to be found, or the good player is riding around with an army, will the evil player actually be able to confront them. But why, you may wonder, would a good player want to be found? Good question. It's because people will do crazy things for love, and fortune favours the bold. If the Dust of Broken Hearts item is used on Sorsha or Mad Martigan while they are in the same location, they will fall in love. From then on, each time they meet, there is an increased chance of Sorsha turning good and helping them to defeat Bav Morda. I think this is such a fun little twist in the gameplay, and it does create interesting situations, because it encourages Mad Martigan to be reckless, to reveal himself to Sorsha at every opportunity, which of course, also increases the chances he will get a slap. Similarly, it encourages Sorsha to play a bit more cautiously around Mad Martigan, perhaps not rushing to engage him in combat, but instead falling back and waiting for General Kale to deal with it. The mechanisms of the game actively encourage styles of play that reflect the characters from the movie and how their relationship develops. That's nice work. But that's pretty much it. The heroes race around the board, playing hot potato with Alora Danon to keep her location secret while gathering the treasures they need to win. Meanwhile, the villains run around trying to locate the heroes and steal Alora away, playing events and foes as the chances arise to improve their odds of winning. While the core elements of gameplay for both sides are the same, it feels asymmetrical because of the different goals and also because of the limitations on each side. Heroes can't play foe cards on villains and neither do they want to risk open confrontation with villains because if they lose, they have to discard their cards and hand over Alora if they have her. And ultimately, they don't gain much from doing it anyway. Their time is much better spent accessing places of power and accumulating treasures. Treasures, which it's worth noting, villains are unable to claim. Villains, conversely, can play all the foe cards as if they are rousing every dark minion across the land to hunt down the babe foretold. But while they are the aggressors here, the villains are disadvantaged in several ways. They always have to hunt for the heroes before engaging them, and also they are outnumbered. With four heroes, potentially five if Mad Martikin can put his smoothest moves on Sorsha, against just one villain, evil players are constantly forced to make difficult choices about which heroes to chase down as they try to figure out where Alora is hiding. It's pretty darn neat, actually. There are some negatives, a few minor things. Starting the game as Mad Martikin isn't great because you don't get to do much for a little while, and there is the potential to spend several infuriating turns in a row, rolling low on your stealth checks trying to access a place of power. And I really would have appreciated smaller standees and a bigger board. Nothing too serious though. I think it's fun that the game is for up to six players, and those players are divided into two uneven teams, with the chance for one evil player to swap sides. However, because of that format, I do think some issues become apparent at all player counts. With a full complement of six players, the player controlling Sorsha is at risk of swapping sides at some point, which they might not appreciate. While with less players, some people are left juggling several characters, each with their own hand of cards to manage. Five is a good number, as you can have one person controlling both evil characters, with four other players each taking on the role of a hero. It feels like a traditional heroes versus dungeon master situation then. I do think the game works well with just two players as well, but both players must keep track of a lot of cards. I guess there's not much more to say than that. This is a solid adventuring game. It plays pretty smoothly, doesn't take long to learn or teach, and everything you would expect to see from the movie is here. Magic acorns, trolls, goats, brownies, death dogs, fairies, and burgle cut. The gameplay is straightforward, but has enough elements to bring key moments from the film to life you will get to do the things the characters in the movie do, and in that regard, it does a good job of letting you relive, and possibly reshape, the adventure. If you're a fan of the film, I would say this game has almost everything you would be looking for in a faithful adaptation. Except good artwork. But that's it from me for now, thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider pressing the like button. If you've really enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing if you don't already do so, and hopefully, I'll see you all again very soon. Bye bye everyone. Bye-bye.